Math 43, welcome to our first summary keynote. This is for chapter one, and I'm, I'm going to break this up into two parts, um, just because chapter one and chapter two, they're, they're pretty long chapters. So chapter one, let's, let's review some vocab. If we have our population, right, entire collection of individuals or objects that we want to gather information upon, um, we could think of it as this giant purple square. And then a lot of times we don't go after our entire population. Right? It takes a lot of time, costs a lot of money. So we just go after a sample. And, and it's a smaller subset of your population. And keep in mind, if you ever wanted to actually survey your entire population, we would have to run the census, right? That's what that means to actually sample your entire population. Um, that takes a lot of effort to do it. So the next slide is just a bunch of Google images to take a look at this idea, right? So you can see here we had an entire population, right? And they're talking about running the census. And then I took a smaller subset of it, yeah? Entire population, the green and blue folks. And the sample could be the green folks, right? Entire population, maybe at a very um, specific zoo where you only have lions, turtles, and bunnies. And there's my sample, right? Or maybe I have some ants. And here I want to point out that... Um, a lot of times we call population, we give it an, a little letter, capital N, and you've seen me use little n for our sample size. This is pretty standard stats notation that little n is the sample size. All right, so from our population, we grab a sample. All right, and so we have a couple more vocab terms we picked up. We picked up parameter and statistic. All right, parameters come from a population, statistics come from a sample. All right, and I mentioned in those videos that the P words go together. Right? And the S words go together. And the most common stats that we have, we have averages or means. Right? We have standard deviations and proportions. So I'm, I'm pretty confident you've heard of means and averages right? and proportions we've, we've done in Chapter 1. You may or may not have heard of standard deviations yet. And we'll get to it in Chapter 2. But at least this one, whoops, we specifically talked about in Chapter 1. All right? We had those Dixie Cups of those red beads and we looked at, or I should say Dixie cups of beads and we looked at the proportion of red beads. And I'm sure you've heard of an average before. Okay, so a little word analogy, population is to parameter, a sample is to statistic, right? So the P words go together, the S words go together. And keep in mind over, oops, over on this side of things, these guys are just numbers. Oh, my, I don't know, my hand keeps making that. Oh my goodness, hold up. I'm, I'm having fun technical difficulties. Here we go. P words go together. S words go together. All right. And what I was just going to say is these two over here, they're just numbers. All right. They just come from different spots, right? Statistics come from samples. Parameters come from populations. And just to drive a point home, the only way to find a parameter is to run a census. Okay. So now let's head over here. So parameters, we typically use the Greek alphabet to denote them. So I'm going to say at least these first two letters out loud. This is the Greek letter mu, and this is sigma. All right, and so what this first one stands for here, and I'll, oops, let me drag this out. Ooh, I do not know what I'm hitting. Hold on, I'm having all sorts of fun technical difficulties. Just be patient with me for a moment. All right, so this one here is the population mean. And this one here is the population standard deviation. All right, and this one, it's not actually in um, the Greek alphabet system. And I wanna use the notation your book is using. So your book uses P for population proportion. If I had my way, we would actually have used pi because that is in the Greek alphabet, but I, I wanna match your book, so okay. So again, we've got this mu, right? That's lowercase m in the Greek alphabet system. And you can see if I change colors here, it starts with the letter M. That's why we have it, oh my goodness, fun times with technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can do this one more. I. I just seem to be having a good time. Okay, so I lost all my notes from before. Solid, that's great. Okay, so let me rework this. So, oh my goodness, what is happening? Okay, I'm gonna try this third time's a charm or maybe this is fourth time. I really have lost track. So we had mu, sigma, right? And then I said this was for the mean, this was for the standard deviation, and this was for a proportion. 
Okay. So all I was trying to point out is that this is lowercase m in the Greek alphabet. That's why they gave it for the mean, right? Lowercase s, and that came for standard deviation. Now, I do want to um, just take a moment and mention the two sigmas. So you're going to see this symbol in this class and this symbol, symbol. And this is lowercase sigma. And this is uppercase sigma. And you can think of this as our equivalent in English, right? We have lowercase s and capital S, right? Well, they have the same idea in the Greek alphabet. Okay, now those are all the parameters. That's what I was trying to get through. And here are our statistics, right? So x bar, I would say this out loud. We typically say x bar, right? And that is the sample mean. And s is the sample standard deviation. And then P prime is the sample proportion. All right, so what that's saying is if I ever want to find P, right, let's go back to that, that experiment we did. If I wanted to find the true proportion of red beads in that giant container, well, instead of counting out all of the beads, I would just find my sample proportion, put a little margin of error on either side. All right, I would take my statistic, add a little margin of error, and I would make a guess as to what the true proportion was, right? If I had, if I was really interested, let's say in a population mean, but I didn't want to run a census, I would take my sample and find the average, the sample mean, put a little margin of error on either side, right? So the next part in this says we will use statistics to approximate parameters. And when I say approximate, right, we're going to take our statistic and we're going to plus or minus a little margin of error. And I briefly talked about that when we were, if you watch the video on um, me drawing those beads out, all right? So if you haven't, go back and watch that video. Okay, so next slide. So from our population, right, we take a sample, all right? And then from that sample, we'll crunch some kind of number. And from that number, we're going to infer it back up to our population, right? So when I was doing the beads, right, we had the true proportion of red beads, And then I went ahead and I got my Dixie cup and I counted the sample proportion of red beads. Give me a moment. All right, and then I, I think if I remember correctly, our sample proportion was somewhere around 17%. And then I made a little margin of error. I, I made this number up that we were gonna plus or minus 3% to say that the true proportion was somewhere in between 14% and 20% because I added the 3% and subtracted the 3% from 17. And this process here, getting to here, that is called inference. We're inferring something about our population from our sample. Okay, and so, oh gosh, let me get that out. So that's our general workflow. We have a population. Oh, let me switch colors because I've totally written over that. We have a population. We get a sample, we crunch a number, and we approximate a parameter. Now let me get rid of all of those, those um, markings just so you can see them, right? From our population, pick a sample. From our sample, crunch a statistic, and then add a little margin of error and get to our parameter, right? So let me try and do this, right? So we have, here's our population, grab a sample. From our sample, crunch a number. Add a little margin of error, and then try and guess what's going on with your parameter, all right? And we have this idea here that just because you take a sample, you're not always going to get the same number. And, and what I mean, that, that concept, and let me talk about that. I'll write this over here. Actually, let me see if I can erase some of this so it's not as junked up. Give me a moment. I can get those clear. Okay. So here I want to talk about a concept called sampling variability. And sampling variability, I, I mean, let's pay attention to that word. It just means that samples vary. So going back to this Dixie cup idea, all right, you saw me in the video take my one Dixie cup and I got my sample proportion. But you can imagine if I took a different sample, like I got another Dixie cup, I wouldn't get exactly the same statistic, right? That sample 
would vary, right? Or that statistic would vary, I should say, from sample to sample. And so what that's saying here is if you have this state and the parameter is really got a, a diastolic blood pressure of 78 milligrams of mercury, well, one of your sample means might give you a 75, a different sample mean might give you 67, a different one might give you 73, and you might take repeated samples, and they're not always gonna give you the same number. And that concept is called sampling variability. And that'll come back into play in chapter seven. I know that feels like it's a long ways away, but it's coming back. All right, so let's talk about the census. All right, and in a couple of years, I'll actually be able to update this. So here was the 2010 census. Um, and you can see up here that as of 2010, we had 308 million folks in, in our country, right? And if I find California, I've seen it before. Let me spot it. There it is. We had nearly 38 mil or 37 million, a little over 37 million in our state last count. I'll be very curious to see what the 2020 census tells us about our state. I have a feeling we've grown, but I might be wrong, so I'll, I'll be very interested to see. Now, if we want the actual number here, it came from the Census Bureau, right? So 308,745,538. And again, it's always this process. From your population, pick a sample, crunch a number, and then generalize it back up to your population, right? We said for those Dixie Cups, given the information in your hand, right? In my, this is the best Google image I could have that looked like my Dixie Cup of beads, Right. Given what I see on my Dixie cup of beads, what could I say about the giant container of beads? Right. And you can imagine if we had multiple folks in class. And again, this is Google images for <laughs> Dixie cups. If somebody had a Dixie cup. Right. And then another student, student B, had a, also had a Dixie cup. And then somebody else had a Dixie cup and somebody else had a Dixie cup and somebody else had a Dixie cup. You can imagine that we would get different statistics, right? Maybe somebody would get 16% red beads and then somebody else would get 20% um, red beads and then, oh gosh, there it goes again. And then, oops, so, we'll, oh my goodness, why is this happening? I'll have to learn why. All right, and then somebody, oh my goodness, I'm having such a good time trying to figure this out. Okay, third or fourth time's a charm? Oh, no, it's not. I'm so sorry. This is me trying to learn how to do stuff on an iPad. Okay, we're going to try this again, and I'm going to try not to touch things. All right, so I was saying I think one student might have like a 17% um, sample proportion. Maybe somebody was at 20%. I've even had it when I used to do this in class where somebody was at like 25%. I think I had one low as, as low as 10%. Oh, my goodness. Okay, at least it's saving it this time. Um, let's say somebody else had 15%, and then last but not least, somebody had 18%. Whatever the numbers are, that's the concept called sampling variability. That as you do repeated samples, you get different statistics each time. It's totally expected, right? And the only way to actually find the true proportion of red beads would be to run that census. Okay, so now let's take a look at quantitative data and qualitative data. So quantitative, we've got discrete right, which is counted, and we've got continuous, which is measured, all right? We've got qualitative data, which means you're, you're giving me words or categories, and you've hear, heard me refer to them as numerical and categorical data. So let's break down the categorical side of things, which is what chapter one tends to focus on, and then we're going to get to what uh, numerical data graphs in chapter two. So here's what I mean by that. So the categorical graphs we've talked about, we've, we've mentioned the pie chart, Right, so this is, again, just Google Images. Here's a very, very busy pie chart. I, I would say that when you get to slices that are that small, you should just create one slice called other because that's just so many um, pie slices in there. Um, this was a 3D pie slice. This was a fun one. This was a um, pie chart of your favorite pies. So you can take a moment and try and say, hey, is your favorite on there or, or is it not? I mean, I got to tell you, I don't know which one my favorite is. Pumpkin's pretty good. Chocolate, they're all good, dude. I love pie. Okay, so we got the pie chart. And then the other thing that we talked about for qualitative data was the bar chart. right? And the, the, one of the big distinguishing factors on a bar chart, it's a graph of rectangles. So I want to just, let me write that. Oops, how did I know that was going to happen? <laughs> all right, so the bar chart, it's a graph of rectangles. 
And then your variable always goes along this x-axis. And if you're talking about a bar chart, you should have a categorical variable along that x-axis. And I mention that because in chapter two, we're gonna make a graph of rectangles again. All right, but you're gonna have a numerical variable down here. And it's going to look just like this bar chart, but because it's a numerical variable, the title for it now will be a histogram. So I just want to put that idea out there, that bar charts and histograms look a lot alike. The only difference is the type of variable that's down there on the x-axis. So you can see that for this one, I have a categorical variable. It looks like it's type of fruit. And typically in bar charts, because they're categorical and they don't really have an order to them, Although in this particular bar chart, it looks like they went alphabetical, right? A, B, G, O, P. Um, but there you, tends to be spaces between each bar. There doesn't have to be, but they tend to have that. Okay, then we have the segmented bar chart. All right, and these are just Google images. All right, and now I went and I found this one. Oh, before I do the Google images, um, you can see again, spaces are between each bars. All right, this, you can see there's a categorical variable here, categorical variable here, and I really want to be specific here. This is event number, and you might say, well, isn't that a numerical data? Um, you can think of it as discrete numerical, all right? Or you could think of it as categorical, because they could have also just as easily called this event A, B, C, D, that kind of thing. So don't get too caught up in, is it a bar chart or is it a histogram? Just, just know that you, you can, especially with discrete numerical data, there's a little bit of a gray area. Um, and we had talked about that a little bit in chapter one. Okay, so I wanna put this one forward and I would encourage you to take a look at this graph, maybe pause the video, all right, and say, all right, taking this entire graph in, and this was a, a poll that was ran in January. Oops, let me erase the stuff we have here so that that's clear. This was taken as a poll of 1,350 adults. It was taken in January, and we were asked, which institution do you have? Again, you can see, do you have a great deal of confidence, quite a lot, not very much, or no confidence at all in the military, Supreme Court, FBI, so on and so forth? So what I would encourage you to do, again, pause the video, and then could you write one or two sentences summarizing what you see? And I, I say this because that's ultimately where we want you to get. I want you to be able to look at a graph and then put into words what it means. So if you saw a segmented bar chart like this, and this came up, this was in an NPR article I was reading, what would you tell folks? Right? What is this information conveying? So pause this for a moment and then try and write a couple of sentences. And then when you're done, unpause it. And I'm going to pretend you've unpaused it now. So I'm going to tell you what I would look at. I would take note, I, I like to look at the highs and lows, the maxes and mins, if you will. And I know this is categorical, but I can see that it looks like adults in the U.S. have the most confidence in the military and the least amount of confidence in Congress. So I might say something like that. So U.S. adults have the most confidence in the military. They have the least amount of confidence in Congress. Okay, those are things I notice. I mean, it looks like they still have a lot of confidence in the Supreme Court, FBI, and the court system. And then it starts to wane. I could even say in the presidency, but it, it definitely starts to wane in this bottom half, right? You can start to see that the gray bars are getting bigger, right? And the greenish, turquoise, blue ones are getting smaller. So I always look for extremes, highs and lows. Okay, so with that, Let's head on to our next one. We also have the comparative bar chart, and that's when you have a categorical variable that itself has been broken into subcategories, right? So you see here there's some product A, product B, product D, and then 
you've got years broken down in front of them. And again, typically you have spaces between the bars when you're looking at a comparative bar chart. And this is just Google images. It wasn't anything fancy that I picked out. All right, then we went to frequency versus relative frequency. So frequency was a whole number. Relative frequency was a percentage. And there are a lot of other numbers that go with relative frequency, right? We can talk about um, fractions, um, a ratio, a proportion. Um, uh, well, we have percentage, right? I, I mean, I'll rewrite it just for fun. And um, when we get there, and we're not there yet, but in chapter three, we'll talk about something called a probability. All right, um, when we get to chapter nine, we'll talk about something called a p-value. But I want to remind you that all of these percentages are numbers between zero and one. All right, so that's what we want to make sure we keep in mind. Okay, so let me go ahead and say, suppose you had a, a history class, right, of sophomores, and I gave you these letter grades, right, seven students with an F, nine with a D, so on and so forth. And I said, hey, you're looking at frequencies right now. Can you convert them? to relative frequencies. And we have a formula, right? If we want to get to, oops, excuse me, this probably will now reset all that stuff I just wrote. If we want to get to relative frequency, we take our frequency and we divide by sample size, right? That's the formula. So if I want to go from here to here, I just need to take that frequency number and divide it by sample size. And on the flip of it, if you ever wanted to go back, if you wanted to go from relative frequency back to frequency, you would multiply by sample size. So here I would multiply by n, here I divide by n. So what I need to do here is if I want to take these frequency numbers and convert them to their relative frequency equivalents, what I need to do is find my sample size. So let's be constructive or at least intentional here. If I think of 18 and 12, that's 30, right? seven, and let me put, oh my goodness, I think it again, it'll erase all of my little scratches. Oh well, oh my goodness, I, I'm sorry gang, I'm still not sure how to do this exactly. It has something to do with me not putting my stylus on. Let me put my stylus on and then I can do it. Okay, so this was 30, here we had 16, and we had four, so when I total that out, I'm getting my sample size is 50. So if I want to convert this to a relative frequency, I need to, oh my goodness, Okay, so we left off with n equaling 50. So we want to convert these to relative frequencies. Oh, it looks like I changed my pen color. Uh, oh my, I swear we'll do it. Okay, if I want to get to, will it let me erase? No, okay, cool. If I want to get to relative frequencies, what I want to do, oh my goodness, gang, I'm so sorry. I just want to write 7 out of 50. That is all I'm trying to write. I want to go 7, not in that color. Let's go 7. Okay, 7 out of 50, right? And then I want to go 9 out of 50. And then I want to go 18 out of 50, right? And I want to do all of that and convert those to decimals. And that's the numbers I would get, right? So I would get that, yeah, I could tell you 7 students got an F, or really I could say 14% of students got an F. I could say 12 students got a B, or really I could say 24% of my students got a B. And the reason relative frequencies are a little bit nicer is because it allows us to compare this history class with any history class, regardless of sample size. If I was using frequency data, I could only compare it to another class that had exactly 50 students. It's one of the reasons that if we were in a class and we were doing that Dixie Cup, with the red beads, if I was having us do that, and I used to do this when we were in class, if I was doing the Dixie Cup with the red beads and I'd have every student go around and count their own sample proportion, I had to do, as I went around the room, I had to do a relative frequency because not every student had the exact same number of beads in their Dixie Cup. All right, so a lot of times I always prefer relative frequencies. I think they're more honest statistics. All right, so we've got frequency, relative frequency, cumulative frequency, and cumulative relative frequency. Two of these are whole numbers, and then two of these are percentages or decimals. All right, so let's say we were taking a look at a zookeeper who was keeping some snakes in a zoo and recording the um, results in this table. Now, we have our little frequency and cumulative frequency column, and I want to remind you how you can zigzag, right? So I start with zero and I move it over here, and then I go zero plus two is two. Two plus four is six. Right, 6 plus 10 is 16. 
so on and so forth. And you can see down here, right, this is always your sample size. And another way I could have gotten sample size is I could have added all of these numbers and gotten to n equaling 50. And I want to show you a different way to go about this. So let me erase all my work here. And I want to show you a backwards way. So imagine you didn't know these numbers. I'm going to try and X them out for just a moment. All right, and let's say I wanted to just get the frequencies over here. All right, so what would happen is I could say, actually, and just for, I like to put it over here. So let me, let me say that I wanted to get the frequencies. I'm just going to leave it right here. I would know that if a zero was here, I must have started with a zero. So I'll keep that in mind, okay? So I started with the zero. And then I have to think zero plus what would have gotten me two, and it would have been two. Two plus what would have gotten me six, and it must have been four, right? Six plus what must have gotten me 16, it must have been 10, right? Or you could go the other way. You could say, hey, hey what about 50, right? 50 minus 47 is a three, right? What about 47 and 44? Well, 47 minus 44 is also a three. And you can reverse engineer this entire thing if you want to, right? And let me erase all of this just so you can see it. There we go. Now, another thing I wanna point out, let's just take this row and interpret some stuff for right now. So if we had a frequency of 10 and a length of 34, what I could say here is that, oops, let me get this going. So I could say, Oh my goodness, stop. I'm going to try this again. So 10 snakes. Oops, and let me remind us we're going here. So I could say 10 snakes have a length of 30 to 40 centimeters. Now, if I wanted to interpret this number with 16, what I could say here is that 16 snakes had a length Oops, oh my goodness. I had a length, let me, oh my gosh. Sorry, gang. One of these days I will figure this out. Okay, so what I was trying to say is had a length of 40 or fewer centimeters. All right, or I should say 40 centimeters or fewer. 40 centimeters or less, that might sound better. 40 centimeters or less. So let's make sure that we can interpret what each of those um, ordered pair, I think of it as an ordered pair, like an X value, because a value of my variable and a frequency, or a value of my variable and a cumulative frequency. All right, now, if I wanted to convert any of these, let me erase all of this. If I wanted to convert any of this, oops, apparently I can't erase more than that. Um, if I wanted to go to relative frequency, oh my goodness, why does this happen? So if I want to go to relative frequency, I would need to total these numbers out get my sample size. Oh, I don't know what my sample size is offhand. I'll, I'll leave that as a question mark. And then I would divide each of these numbers by that sample size, and that would get me my relative frequency. And I could do the same thing here. If I divided all of these by n, whatever that n is, I could get my cumulative relative frequency. Okay. And I don't think I can erase my sentences. And what I was trying to show us here is cumulative graphs, if we look at them, and I'll just draw real quick this thing. So our cumulative graph, it will always increase as you move left to right. And if you look on the x-axis there, you're gonna see something saying lower quartile, median, and upper quartile. And you don't really need to worry about those words just yet, they're coming in chapter two. So if I just wanted to give you a heads up, these vocab terms, they're coming in chapter two. All right. So with that, if we've got cumulative frequency here and cumulative relative frequency here, if you take a look at those two graphs, I want you to think, okay, what's the difference between them? Because this is all about golfers and their age. But taking a look at the x, excuse me, the y-axis is where you'll see the difference, right? So you'll see relative here, and that's why you see percentages on the y-axis. You just see frequency here, and that's why you see whole numbers on the x-axis. So that's the only difference between them. Now just for fun, if I wanted to take a look at an ordered pair here, so this looks like 59 here. Let me write the ordered pair, 59, and then what does that look to be? Let's just say it looks pretty close to about 0.6, right? So I could say here 60% of golfers 
are 59 years old or younger. Okay. All right. So that's what's different between them, right? Whole numbers versus percentages and cumulative graphs always increase as you move left to right. So let's say I gave you a frequency curve and I asked you, hey, oops, we're going to pretend that we didn't see that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> hold up. If I gave you a frequency curve and I said, hey, could you draw me a cumulative graph? Right? And I want us to kind of get an idea behind this. So let's say I had test scores here. And we had frequency here. Let's read this graph. So if I'm going to guess, it looks like maybe one student scored 35, right? And if I look at 45, let me erase. Well, I can't erase a bit at a time. But if I look at 45, maybe that looks to be about, I don't know, two or three students. So I'll put 45, there were about three students. Right? And if I look at 55, maybe about 10 of them. And if I put 65... See, 65 is, it's a little bit higher than 60, so maybe it's um, 65, just for fun. Let's see what 75 is. 75 looks like it's about 110. So where I'm going with this is if I wanted to make that cumulative frequency, let's add a column here, cumulative frequency, we could zigzag. All right, so the one would come over. Actually, I'm going to do this in a different color just so we can see it. So the one would come over, all right? One plus three would give me four. Four plus 10 would give me 14. 14 plus 65 would give me, let me do the math, I think that would be 79. And 79 plus 110 would be 189. Okay, so then if I wanted to make my cumulative graph, oops, well, you start to see it now coming up. Does it have my notes from before? Oh my goodness, did it run out? It might have, hold on. Oh my gosh, let me do that. Oh, my notes are gone. Well, if I wanted to make my cumulative graph, I'll just kind of, no, I'm just gonna, since I'm failing on all fronts, I'm just gonna move this over here. So in terms of the cumulative graph, you can see it went to, from one to maybe four, I think we're at like 14. And then maybe we were at like 70 something and then 180 something. I can't quite remember the numbers. You'll have to look back on the video, but you can kind of see that cumulative curve starting and you can see my Y axis is labeled with cumulatives. And since this is the heaviest part of the peak, right? Or the highest part, that's why you see the growth is the steepest here. And you can see that it levels off, right? We're not gaining that much. There's not that many frequency for students that scored that high. And that's why it levels off here. And this is actually called logistic growth. And when I say logistic growth, I mean something that starts growing small, it speeds up, and then it levels off. And something that we're seeing right now, or at least as I'm recording this, is this is how COVID is spreading. All right. Now, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm recording this um, in May of 2020. So starting back in, let me do a different color, starting back in February, right, we were here, and then in April and May, we really started to climb. And I don't know what's about to happen. I don't know if this next span is just going to be June and July, and then we level off at August, or if this is going to be June, July, August, September, October. I don't know when it's going to level off. I do know it will level off. I just don't know when. All right, I know that was long. That's only the first half of this keynote. But, but you got it so far. All right, so join me for the second part, and I will see you in a little bit. Thanks so much. Bye.